In Switzerland, engineers have embarked on one of the boldest, most extreme engineering projects in history. A tunnel on a scale so gargantuan, no one has dared attempt anything like it before. Over 35 miles long, the longest tunnel in the world will cut through the heart of the Swiss Alps. The risky plan to redirect the crush of Europe's traffic and cargo not over the Alps, but under them. To do this, miners will have to punch their way through some of the hardest rock on Earth. It will take the largest drilling machines on this planet, each more than three stories high and longer than four football fields, drilling 24 hours a day for six years to get the job done. The project is incredibly dangerous and outrageously expensive. The price tag, seven billion dollars. Can it be done? Or will unforeseen problems bankrupt the project before it's finished? Will engineers be able to avoid the horrible fate of so many other tunnels? Fire. Disaster. And death. Outside world, Switzerland is a picture postcard. But the reality is not so pretty. Because of Switzerland's central location, each year 14 million trucks and cars coming from every corner of Europe pass through Switzerland on their way elsewhere. The sheer volume is fast turning this country into the biggest traffic jam in the world. An obvious solution. Put more freight and passengers onto trains to reduce the number of trucks and cars on the road. But it isn't that simple. The antiquated railway system is already jammed to capacity. In 1998, Swiss voters decided that something had to be done. So they voted to authorize a whopping $21 billion for a mammoth project. A high-speed rail network to be built under the Alps, connecting Switzerland to the major cities of Europe. The scale of the proposed project was staggering. It would require two separate tunnels. Each one far longer than any mountain tunnel ever built. The shorter of the tunnels, named Lochberg, would run for 21 miles under the mountains in southwest Switzerland. 50 miles to the east, an even longer tunnel would run 35 miles through the Alps. Since it would run directly under a mountain range named Gotthard, it would be called the Gotthard Tunnel. Three times longer than any other mountain tunnel in the world, the Gotthard Tunnel alone will cost seven billion dollars. Enough to have built the Golden Gate Bridge 17 times. The tunnel's path will be straight and flat right through the base of the mountain range. This route will let freight trains race through the mountain at 100 miles per hour, more than double their current speed. And passenger trains will go even faster, up to 155 miles per hour. Swiss voters were sold on the benefits of the proposed project 
but they were also worried. They insisted that designers come up with plans to minimize the project's potentially devastating environmental impact. So the contract approved by the voters put enormous pressure on the engineers and the contractors. First, there was the guarantee. The engineers would need to certify that the tunnel would last at least 100 years. That meant that literally every material used in the tunnel would need to be subjected to the most rigorous testing in history. But that wasn't all. The contract also called for the tunnel to be built fast. And if the builders made mistakes that put the project behind schedule or over budget, they would risk paying stiff financial penalties. You're not allowed to forget cost and time scheduling. Those are very risky things. And you just got to keep all of that in control. And everybody's just really aware of the whole world is watching us and we've got to get everything right. Even without these added pressures, the gutter tunnel project would still seem like an impossible task. Just from the scale of the work itself. The miners will have to dig 24 million tons of rock out of the Alps. An amount that would fill over 16 football stadiums. Working conditions are extreme because the tunnel lies so deep underground, temperatures inside can reach 115 degrees. The miners work in near darkness and breathe thin, dusty air. Every day, they put their lives on the line. The biggest danger is lack of oxygen. In case of emergency fire explosion, the first thing that goes is the oxygen to breathe, because we're underground. We've got dumpers, we've got excavation machinery that move back and forwards. So they're just moving around all the time. It's dark. Drivers don't see people walking around behind. And it could be if they reverse out that somebody gets hit by machinery. And the dangers don't stop there. Tunneling, after all, is a battle between man and the earth itself. Cavins are a constant threat. To minimize the risk, geologists take samples deep inside the mountain before any drilling begins to find out just what kind of rock the drillers might encounter. A lot of sections, we have rocks like this. Real hard, nice granites where we go through by a tunneling boring machine. The tunnel boring machine, or TBM, designed for the Goddard Tunnel, can chew away at hard rock. But if the miners encounter soft or unstable areas, they have to use a different method. The rock must be drilled and then blasted out. And in areas where there are high-pressure water zones and crumbly rock, none of these methods can be used. And the danger increases exponentially. In 1996, during the initial surveys, geologists discovered such an area, sitting near the path of the proposed tunnel. The geological team taking core samples got hit by a sudden, powerful explosion of sand and water. It's like you're uh, in a submarine, 3,000 feet under sea level, and you drill outside into the sea. You hope that the water doesn't come in into the submarine. So it's really life dangerous. Fortunately, no one was killed in the accident. But the incident threatened to stop the project in its tracks. The engineers estimated that stabilizing the area would cost an extra $600 million. That money simply wasn't in the budget. It took another half year of drilling deeper down before the geologists found a route that avoided the danger zone. 
And then we found a totally different rock. We found a marble. So this is not a, a difficult rock, so we can go through by TBM. Now that a safe path through the mountain had been determined, the design team could move on to their next big decision. What would the tunnels themselves look like? A single large tunnel with two sets of tracks inside would be the cheapest solution. But this design had a fatal flaw. If a train derailed inside the tunnel, it could hit an oncoming train or block the tunnel in both directions. A safer alternative would be the three-tube system, like the one used in the channel between France and England. The channel has two single tunnels, one for each direction, and a smaller central tunnel for emergencies. That third tunnel proved a lifesaver on November 18, 1996. That evening, a train carrying several trucks entered the tunnel on the French side. The conductor was unaware that one of the trucks had somehow caught on fire. At the time, there were six trains in the tunnel, including two passenger trains. Twelve miles inside, the conductor brought the burning train to a dead stop. He tried to get the passengers out, but the smoke was so thick they could barely see the exits. Eventually, they were able to make their way to the safety of the central emergency tunnel. They were very lucky. The fire was so intense in the tunnel they had left it melted part of the concrete lining. Two people suffered serious smoke inhalation. But thanks to that central emergency tunnel, nobody died. The lesson was clear. Tunnels will always be dangerous places. But a good design can reduce the risks. You will never get a completely risk-free tunnel. You have to design it to cope with the foreseeable risks that might be um, faced. But at the end of the day, there are certain things that are called emergencies in which you have to have an emergency plan, whatever the situation you have. The Swiss engineers carefully considered the pros and cons of each design. The single tube system was clearly too dangerous. But the three tube system was far too expensive. So they came up with something else. A double tube design. Separate tunnels going north and south that would reduce the risk of a head-on collision. To enhance safety, they added passageways every 1,000 feet. These would allow emergency crews to move between both tubes. Two crossover points along the track would allow trains to switch from one tunnel to the other in an emergency. The designers added another crucial feature. A series of small passageways connected to an escape route that crosses over to the other side. Each tube would have two of these emergency stations. If a fire were ever detected, the computers in the command center would guide trains directly to the closest emergency station. Passengers would then evacuate the train and make their way to safety. A pair of massive ventilators at the portals would bring in fresh air and push out the smoke. On paper, this is perhaps the safest railway tunnel ever designed. But until it's tested, no one will know for sure. Now, the engineers had a workable design. Next, they needed to plot the tunnel's precise path. The plan called for massive tunnel boring machines to burrow in from the north and south, 
The trick is how to make sure they meet in the middle. If they miss by just six inches, tunnel workers will need to redig hundreds of feet of tunnel to get back on track. So to make sure they had the most accurate mapping information, the engineers turned to the global positioning system, GPS. GPS receivers were placed at the north and south tunnel entrances as well as three intermediate points along the proposed path of the tunnel. Next, four GPS satellite in geosynchronous orbit above the Earth beamed signals to the receivers, which gave them their precise coordinates, latitude, longitude, and altitude. Once the engineers had these coordinates, all they needed to do was connect the dots. The plans were complete. Now the real work could begin. Base camps were set up to launch the attack on the mountain. Because the job is so enormous, the engineers plan to enter the mountain from five distinct starting points. It's a new system or a new way to excavate such a long tunnel. It would have taken us about 20 years to meet up because it's so long. Through, with these measures of attacking with three intermediate attacks, we've speeded up the whole excavation phase by about six to, to 10 years. Each starting point would have its own base camp, complete with concrete factory, water treatment center, living quarters for workers, cafeteria, even a mass transit system. The base camps would play a crucial role in keeping environmental damage to a minimum. A major concern was water. Drilling would contaminate huge quantities of pure mountain water that had been locked inside the mountain for millions of years. Water treatment plants at each base camp would filter out contaminants and then channel the water to nearby rivers. But an even greater concern, rock debris. What could be done with the 24 million tons of rock the miners would carve out of the mountain? they came up with an ingenious plan. Recycle it back into the project. Concrete factories at each site would transform the rock to produce the seven and a half million tons of concrete needed to line the tunnel walls. That's enough concrete to pave an eight lane highway 300 miles long. Once the facilities were in place, project managers could start bringing in manpower. 1,800 workers were brought in from all over the world. Among them, the world's best technicians, explosive experts, and heavy machine operators. With the army in place, the full-scale attack on the mountain could begin. Their first task, build access tunnels into the rock. These tunnels are needed to get the workers and equipment to the actual work site deep inside the mountain. The workers would enter the rock in trains, buses, even an elevator. The schedule required work to go on around the clock, seven days a week for 12 years. Drilling, digging, blasting. Just to make the deadline. But even at that pace, the project would be completely impossible without this. This is one of the biggest tunnel boring machines in the world. 
It's a drill with a drill bit 30 feet in diameter, designed to bore a tunnel through some of the hardest rock in the world. How big is it? Three stories high, four football fields long. At full throttle, it can advance through 130 feet of solid rock in a day. But even this gargantuan machine had never been tested under these conditions. Could it withstand six years of constant grinding? To improve the odds, the engineers had to arm the machine with the best possible weaponry, custom made for the job. The best custom drill bits for tunnel machines are designed here at the Colorado School of Mines. Up, uh, looks like you are getting some overbreak over here. Where researchers test individual cutters, the steel alloy rollers that actually grind the rock face. To guarantee each cutter is best suited for its job, a rock sample from the tunnel site is placed on this machine. A cutter rolls over the rock again and again. The machine measures the force needed to cut through this rock. The data we get from these tests allows us to design cutter heads that will best match the tunnel boring machine to the rock being bored through, thus making the machine most productive as it can be or go as fast as it can. The testing is critical. If the cutters are not made right, they could wear prematurely and slow the project down. 58 of these cutters, each 17 inches in diameter, are mounted to the front of the boring machine's cutter head. The custom-designed cutter head was made in Germany and then shipped to the tunnel site back in Switzerland. It then took three more months for technicians to attach the cutter head to the machine. Meanwhile, the clock kept ticking. In November 2002, the cutters finally had a chance to test their chops. It was a critical moment. Engineers, miners and politicians gathered in the depths of the Alps to see if the giant would really work. They waited. Suddenly the beast came alive. Its 3,500 kilowatt engine cranking out 4,700 horsepower. The massive cutter head turning, pulverizing the granite into tiny bits. Everyone breathed a gigantic sigh of relief. Of course, the cutter head doesn't do the job alone. The Goddard's tunnel boring machine is a complex marvel made up of 90,000 parts. Aimed precisely in the direction of the tunnel to be, a pair of gripper pads is pressed against the rock, locking the boring machine in place. The powerful hydraulic arms attached to the gripper pads push the cutter head forward, driving it into the rock. The cutter head turns counterclockwise, crushing the rock into small chips with its 58 cutters. Each cutter can exert 26 tons of force. That's like 58 cars simultaneously hitting a rock wall at 26 miles per hour. As the cutter head grinds, the small chips fall into a set of rotating buckets. The buckets deposit the chips onto a conveyor belt, which shuttles them out of the tunnel and onto the concrete processing plant. But the tunnel boring machine does a lot more than grind the rock. 
directly behind the cutter head. A set of robotic drills punches holes in the tunnel wall. For bolt anchors, to keep loose rock from falling in. 65 yards behind the cutter head, a robotic arm sprays every square foot of new wall with a liquefied concrete called shotcrete. In a matter of seconds, the shotcrete dries, hardens, and binds to the tunnel walls. It provides a tough inner skin, which is added insurance against cave-ins. After every seven-foot advance, the workers must stop to reposition the grippers, and the process starts all over again. The project is so massive and the schedule so tight, the job requires not one, but six of these $21 million tunnel boring machines. One pair bores north from the south entrance, while a second pair grinds south from a midway point. Then a third pair of machines will start at the north entrance and drill south toward the midway point. If all goes as planned, the big machines will finish their part of the job in June 2009. But there are plenty of unknowns. And as powerful as the boring machines are, there are some places in the tunnel where they can't be used. That's because these machines can dig only straight and only through hard rock. But the gutter tunnel will pass through a few areas where the rock turns soft or is broken and unstable. The risk of a cave-in is simply too high in these spots to use the machine. So they have to be dug out the old-fashioned way. By drilling and blasting. This machine is called the Rocket Boomer. It's a huge rock drill, capable of choreographing an explosion so potent, it can remove a perfect circle of rock up to 19 feet thick. First, a technician uses a laser beam to align the drill. Next, the Rocket Boomer's computer calculates the blast pattern that will deliver the most bang for the buck. Then the drilling begins. Over 80 holes, up to 19 feet into the rock. Into these holes, a technician pumps precisely measured doses of two different chemicals. Each chemical on its own is completely harmless. But if the recipe is right, together they will become a volatile cocktail. To ignite the explosion, the technicians insert an electrical detonator into each hole. With all the leads linked together, a jolt of electricity sets off a massive blast. Once the dust settles, the rubble is shoveled out. A single blast like this takes eight hours to pull off. Their workday done, the blast team now makes way for the next shift, who will prepare the next blast. Each day, on every front, the workers fight to advance into the rock as far as they can. The drilling team leads the way. 
they're backed up by a second unit, following closely on their heels, performing another crucial part of the job, building the concrete lining of the tunnel. 50 miles west of the Goddard, the drilling team working on the 21-mile-long Lochberg Tunnel has almost completed the digging phase of the project. They've also already sprayed the tunnel walls with a layer of shotcrete, the liquefied concrete that stabilizes the rock as it dries. Now, the tunnel is almost ready for its final concrete lining. First, it must be carefully prepared. At this stage, water is the enemy. Groundwater is always seeping through the rock and must be drained away. If not, water pressure can build up and literally push in the concrete lining of the tunnel. To prevent this, the team applies an ingenious system of layering to the shotcrete wall. The first layer is a white plastic webbed mesh. The water trickles down the mesh into a drainage system at the bottom of the tunnel. A second layer of solid plastic sheeting seals off any remaining water behind it. This should make the inside of the tunnel waterproof. Next, huge metal forms are put into place. And then, concrete is injected behind them. As the concrete dries, engineers keep water running over its surface so it won't crack. When the metal forms are removed, the smooth, final concrete lining is left behind. Of course, the concrete used in these tunnels is no ordinary concrete. The designers have guaranteed that the tunnels will last at least a century. So everything that goes into the tunnel has been put through the most rigorous testing in the industry. And that's done here, at the most advanced tunnel testing facility in the world, the Hagerbach Test Tunnel, 40 miles northeast of the Goddard. The Hagerbach Test Site is a labyrinth of tunnels crisscrossing and stretching two and a half miles into the mountain. Here, engineers must test and approve everything used inside the Swiss Alp Tunnel project. In this laboratory, engineers subject concrete blocks to extreme pressure. The concrete lining has to hold up under the mountain's weight as the rock settles. When the deformation and the, the force is, is too high in such a tunnel, then you have some cracks in the lining or uh, the worst case is, is that the lining can break down. Here, engineers are fine-tuning a shotcrete recipe. A mix of sand, gravel, water and cement that is sprayed onto the tunnel's bare rock walls. The precise ratio of ingredients is crucial. Too little water, the shotcrete will be too thick to spray. Too much water, it will be too weak. Shotcrete also must be able to withstand extreme hot and cold temperatures. In this area, engineers are testing explosives. Different types of rock need different formulas. Because the Goddard Tunnel has extremely hard rock, they need an explosive with a lot of kick. These tunnels are also used to test people, to prepare them for disaster. Fire is one of the biggest dangers in a tunnel. Using wooden crates and gasoline, 
the engineers simulate a common tunnel accident scenario, a truck on fire. In just a few minutes, the fire is a raging inferno. In a fire, a tunnel acts just like an oven. Temperatures can exceed 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to vaporize human flesh, even concrete. So firefighters have to be trained to move fast to knock down any blaze. Tunnels are also dangerous because they're cut off from air and light. Emergency crews can find their access blocked. The longer a tunnel, the longer it could take to get out if disaster should strike. And that happens more frequently than most people realize. March 24th, 1999, started out like any other day. At 10.45 a.m., cars and trucks were speeding into the Mont Blanc tunnel between France and Italy, unaware of what was about to engulf them. About four miles into the tunnel on the French side, a truck driver noticed smoke pouring from the back of his rig. He pulled over. But within seconds, his truck was completely consumed in flames. Unfortunately, the ventilation system was no match for the smoke. It was so thick, it took emergency crews an entire day just to reach the blaze. The fire burned for days. When it was all over, 39 people were dead. Temperatures inside the tunnel had reached 2,300 degrees, melting sections of the concrete lining. The disaster forced a major redesign of the tunnel's emergency systems. Learning from previous accidents or incidents is absolutely vital. It is one way that you understand how incidents occur, why they occur, how they develop, how people reacted to the incident in any one case, what worked well and what didn't work well. In this case, the lessons were learned the hard way. So engineers were determined to get things right the next time around. First, they added 76 high-powered fans to blow out smoke and bring in fresh air. They set up fire stations inside the tunnel so crews can get to the fire quicker. Now, heat sensors at each entrance scan all trucks for overheated engines. 120 cameras linked to command control centers monitor traffic around the clock. The number of emergency shelters was doubled. There are now 37, placed every 1,000 feet running the full length of the Mont Blanc tunnel. Every shelter has a direct phone line to the central control room. And the engineers added something new, a way out of the tunnel. Inside each shelter, a stairway leads to a passageway below the main tunnel. In a disaster, Emergency crews would be waiting there to take the drivers out. The redesigned Mont Blanc tunnel is considered one of the safest in the world. But even with all the new features, there will always be a risk. No tunnel is 100% safe. Fires occurs in tunnels simply because there is flammable material and sources of ignition and you will never eliminate those completely. The risk of a fire haunts the designers of the new Goddard Tunnel. Some freight traveling through it will be lethal. Volatile fuels and chemicals that could catch on fire, or even worse, explode.
The year is 2015. The new high-speed rail through the Goddard Tunnel is a huge success. Just as the designers had predicted, the roads now run free of traffic jams. But today, things could change. A small fire has just erupted on a freight train also carrying passengers. No one on board sees the fire. And the train is carrying a dangerous cargo of highly flammable fuel. 12 miles inside the tunnel, a passenger suddenly notices the smoke and alerts the conductor. The train's only hope, make it to an emergency station. The conductor knows that a massive explosion could happen any minute. If he can't evacuate his passengers, all of them will likely perish. In the command center, alarm sound. Emergency crews are dispatched to the scene. But now the train is 15 miles in. The tunnel continues to fill with thick, poisonous smoke. The conductor sees the emergency station up ahead. Now, the massive fans kick in, blowing out the noxious smoke just long enough for passengers to see their way out to the emergency station. The conductor quickly herds the passengers through the station, out of harm's way. The fire crews stamp out the fire before it reaches the flammable cargo. Disaster is averted. The passengers make it to safety. The only casualties are a few cases of smoke inhalation. The system worked. At least that's the way the planners hope it will happen. But no one will know for sure until the tunnel is built and undergoes a real emergency. The Goddard Tunnel engineers are confident that their fail-safe system under the Alps will keep passengers alive even in the worst case scenario. They have also boldly guaranteed that they will finish their tunnel on time, on budget, and that it will last 100 years. And if the engineers get it right, the new Goddard and its sister tunnel, the Lochberg, may become models for a new generation of high-speed rail tunnels showing other nations how to transcend the highest barriers that nature has created from the Rockies to the Himalayas.